Hello and welcome to this edition of Standard Deviation, my column and video series. I'm TCA Sharad Raghavan, Deputy Editor at The Print, and I'm going to be speaking to you about how the Modi government is increasingly taking on criticism from international agencies in a strong, well-argued way, and how this is thanks to a particular team of people that it has created. Now, governments have to walk a tightrope between mounting legitimate defenses against criticism and appearing too defensive and thin-skinned. Unfortunately, until recently, the Narendra Modi government has come across as leaning too far on the defensive side, taking snap decisions and issuing poorly thought-out statements. That is changing now, at least when it comes to addressing international criticism over its financial policies. The government's recent defenses have been increasingly reasoned and data-based. It's a welcome change. Global perceptions of the Indian economy are often based on what international agencies like the IMF and credit rating agencies such as S&P Global and Moody's have to say. Not too long ago, any negative assessments from such agencies were met with weak responses by the Indian government and would be based more on rhetoric rather than actual data or reasoned arguments. There has been a gradual transformation in this approach and much of it has to do with the officials chosen to lead the central bank and the economic research agencies of the government. Two recent examples of Indian authorities standing up for themselves come to mind. The first is when the RBI and the central government responded to the IMF's assessment that the central bank had been over-regulating the exchange rate. The second example is the deeply researched analysis by the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor pointing out the weaknesses of the analysis done by the credit rating agencies. Now, take a look at the key players involved from the India side. The RBI's response to the IMF would have been vetted by Governor Shaktikanta Das, who used to be the Economic Affairs Secretary in the Ministry of Finance. The government side was put forth by the current Chief Economic Advisor, V. Anant Nageshwaran, who is a highly data-oriented analyst and executive director in the IMF, K.V. Subramanian, who was also a chief economic advisor in the past. Add to this the caliber of the current finance secretary, T.V. Somanathan, who is the top bureaucrat in the finance ministry, and the increasingly technically savvy officials in the office of the prime minister. Between them, they have years of experience in setting government economic policy, comfort with data and its analysis, and a drive to portray India in the best possible light. This combination shows itself in the kind of discussions that are now taking place on India's financial policy. The IMF in mid-December released the 2023 edition of its annual Article 4 report on the Indian economy. It's a detailed assessment based on the IMF staff's visits to India, their discussions with senior officials in the Ministry of Finance and the RBI, and including their own data and calculations. Most of the analysis received very little comment. However, one change created quite an uproar in India's financial policy circles. The classification of India's exchange rate regime was revised from the relatively free floating designation to what is called a stabilized arrangement. Now, these are just technical terms to designate countries based on how much they control their exchange rates. Under a floating regime, a country exerts minimal control over its exchange rate, only intervening to stabilize unnatural volatility. Shifting India from this category to a stabilized arrangement means that the IMF feels the RBI had been exerting too much control over its exchange rate in the recent past. See, in general, the more open an economy, the more free its exchange rate. The flip side to this is that if a country's exchange rate is deemed to be more controlled, then its economy is also seen as being more under the influence of government regulation. The IMF said that over the last 7-8 to eight months, the rupee's exchange rate had moved within a narrow 2% range. That is, it never went more than 2% up or 2% down. The RBI did not take this assessment lying down. First, it strongly disagreed with the notion that its exchange rate interventions were more than those necessary to curb unnatural volatility. It pointed out, quite legitimately, that the IMF's assessment covered only 7-8 to eight months 
an analysis of a longer period of say two and a half years would show this assessment was wrong, it said. And yes, when I looked at the exchange rate data from June 2020 to December 2023, it showed the rupee depreciated nearly 10% during this period, well outside the 2% range that the IMF had noted for the last 7 to 8 months. The RBI also argued that the recent stability of India's exchange rate reflects the improving strength of the country's macroeconomic fundamentals, especially external facing ones like a reduction in the current account deficit, a revival of foreign funds coming into the country, and a comfortable foreign exchange reserve buffer. This was bolstered by a sub-report by K.V. Subramanian, which was also included in the main report, which made the same arguments in greater detail. Now, these are data-based facts. While it can't unequivocally be said that it's exclusively these factors that have been responsible for a stable rupee, their impact is still significant. Placing them on record in our defense shows that our authorities are thinking deeply about these issues and have moved away from a knee-jerk response in this case. Now, let's come to the CEA's paper on the credit rating agencies. This paper, released in December, was not a response to any immediate concern. It aimed to understand whether the ratings of these agencies were fair to countries like India. The short version of their answer which was arrived at through econometric and other analysis, was that no, the ratings are neither transparent nor are they fair. The paper first examined the methodologies employed by the three biggest international ratings agencies, Fitch, Moody's and S&P. What it found was that the processes were different and non-transparent for all three, with very little being made public about how the ratings are calculated. The paper then makes the reasonable argument that if one of the factors that determines a country's credit rating is that its data should be transparent, then this transparency should also extend to how the ratings are calculated. The analysis then goes on to show how more than half of the publicly available factors that determine a country's rating were qualitative rather than quantitative. They were based on the opinions and perceptions of a relatively small group of experts rather than more extensive surveys. This dependence on qualitative factors has meant that India's credit rating, which measures its ability and willingness to repay its debt, has not improved even though our economy has risen in the size rankings and has significantly improved its rankings in global indices like ease of doing business, logistics and innovation. Basically, the paper argued that macroeconomic performance has no impact on the credit rating which to me makes no sense. Finally, another reasonable argument the paper makes is that the measure of a country's willingness to pay must be influenced by its past record. During hard times and good times, India has repaid its debt every single time and hasn't defaulted even once. The ratings must reflect this good credit behavior. This makes absolute sense for individuals Repayment behavior has a large bearing on their credit scores. The same should hold true for countries. Overall, the CEA's analysis showed that these agencies apply very different data-based metrics when assigning ratings to companies. However, when it comes to countries, they rely on opaque, perception-based measures. Even within countries, the weightages of the metrics are different for developed and developing ones. Now. This difference is fine in itself. You can't compare developed countries with developing ones. But the basis and methodology for the different calculations needs to be made clear. Although the chief economic advisor was not writing this paper as a direct response to the rating agencies, it is publicly available and I hope that they read it. The credibility of their work depends on whether they are considered fair in their appraisals. India is now a big player in the international economic field. As a result, we will attract a lot of attention and analysis. It's a necessary feature of government policy to engage with criticism and balance legitimate defense against defensiveness. If the government keeps up with this new approach, this might even become part of the stated job descriptions of senior government officials. On that note, that's all from me. Thank you for watching.